Hi there, and a very warm welcome to Season 4, Episode 8 of People Soup. It's Ross McIntosh here. There's definitely been that change, hasn't there, with regards to conversations about mental health becoming more commonplace. I think that a lot of those conversations happen at surface level. They happen on social media. People will wear mental health-based t-shirts. People will get involved with conversations about mental health at a, at a surface level. And I think that's it. I don't know if many detailed deep and nuanced conversations happen about the nature of mental health and about what it means for people and about potential ways forward. You just look at the conversations that happen about mental health. And I'm talking about from celebrities. I'm talking about from the royals. I'm talking about people that you see on TV. Mental health is still pitched as this very abnormal thing that it makes you abnormal if you suffer. And just from that position, the entire conversation about mental health has changed. And my book offers something different. It offers a different perspective. Hey, supers. Thanks for tuning in. This week, I chat to psychologist, author and lecturer, Dr. Nick Hooper, about his new book, The Unbreakable Student. People Soup is an award-winning podcast where we share evidence-based behavioural science in a way that's practical, accessible and fun to nourish your minds to flourish at work. The chat with Nick covers a whole host of topics from my review of his book, Mental Health in the Workplace, How Conversations About Mental Health Have Evolved, The Process of Writing a Book, Building a Platform and Paris Hilton. Let's just have a quick scoot over to the news desk. I wanted to share a review of our last episode called Thanks for Asking, which is from Dr. Stan Steindl. On Twitter, Stan said, Brilliant episode of People Soup. Thank you, Ross. This episode was so moving. I loved the honesty, vulnerability and humour, as well as the heartfelt aspiration for everyone to have a sense of belonging and safeness in the workplace. Hear, hear. Stan, thank you so much for those kind words. It did feel quite... uh, vulnerable episode to publish so i'm really grateful for your feedback if you do enjoy the podcast i'd love it if you would subscribe rate and review it whatever platform you're on it helps us amplify our voice and reach more people with stuff that could be useful for now get a brew on and have a listen to part one of my chat with dr nick hooper dr nick hooper welcome back to people soup now, usually I start these off with a bit of an insight from my research department, but because you're an old friend of the show and been on before, I'm going to invite you just to introduce yourself, just say briefly who you are and what you do. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me back. I'm a big fan of People Soup, and I hope that I add value to your special podcast and that the people who listen to your podcasts uh, see value in what I have to say. Second of all, You've got a research department doing research. How big have you got in the last two years since the last time we spoke that now you've got people working for you? That's amazing. And third of all, me, I am a senior lecturer of psychology at the University of the West of England. I'm into ACT and have spent a long time being into ACT. And the reason why we're talking right now, as in the most notable thing about me right now, is that I've written a new book called The Unbreakable Student which is essentially an ACT book for students, even though it's not called that. A lot of ACT principles are are layered throughout it. And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to having uh, having a chat with you about it, Ross. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. And I may have exaggerated slightly when I said I have a research department. It's just to big up my enterprise, really, when really, don't tell anyone, but it's just me. No, you just told everyone it's just you. I want you to believe in the (laughs) people's soup enterprise. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll just edit that bit out, mate. Okay. <laughs> so Nick, Nick, you've written this book, and I thought a nice place to start for us would be my review of your book because I've been very fortunate to see an advanced copy, and you haven't heard this review yet. I wanted you to hear it fresh from me. Oh, right. Okay. Well, I knew that a review was uh, coming, but I didn't know it was coming live on People Soup podcast, and so. I await with bated breath and nerves and vulnerability 
and excitement all at the same time. And of course, I know you're going to be nice because you're a nice fella. You're not going to rip me to shreds on this, are you? And so um, obviously I want critique as well. So, you know, if, you, if you've if you got sort of more negative things to say about it, I'm, I'm all ears uh, to it, but I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts, Ross, as someone that I respect a lot. Thanks, mate. Well, here we go. Dr. Nick Hooper. Oh, Captain, my Captain, you are an inspiration. Let me tell you about the Unbreakable Student. It's human, it's authentic, it's funny, and it makes behavioral science accessible, useful, and practical for students. Nick draws upon his experience as a human being, his expertise in psychology, and his humanity to bring you a book that I believe should be part of an international strategic approach for young people. I'm going big here, Nick. I've got a vision. It's really, really skilled. It has exercise in it that you'll actually want to have a go at. So I call upon parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles, brothers, sisters, friends. Get this book for the young people in your life. It's far more useful and practical than a sandwich toast or some matching mugs for people going to university. You can use this book to reflect, share ideas, support each other and start conversations. Now, Nick, you know that I work with adults in the workplace, and I know that many of us suffer in the workplace. And as adults, many of us feel stigma or shame if we're suffering or feel we're not coping, and we don't always know where or how to seek help. I believe that sharing these skills in this way with our young people will support them as they navigate their complex student lives. I know these skills and perspectives will also serve them well as they navigate and respond to the challenging and fluctuating circumstances they'll experience in their working lives too. And there was one quote. I I went through it and I highlighted loads of quotes, but I can't read them all out, otherwise it'll turn into a bloody audio book. So there was one quote that just really spoke to me, and it was accompanied by a brilliant illustration by John Paul Flintoff, who's done a brilliant job at bringing to life your words. But let me just read out that that passage that I sort of really attracted me. What I'm saying is that even though you may see lots of people walk around with the words, I'm fine, tattooed on their forehead, the truth is that if you struggle psychologically at some point in your life, that won't make you part of the minority. It will make you part of the majority. It's important to pause and appreciate this fact when we get caught into thinking that we're abnormal for having mental health struggles. And that's me done, mate. Hats off to you, man. Well done. Bloody love it. I really appreciate it, Russ. I mean, the the way that you started the review was what was most encouraging for me, which is I've seen a lot of self-help books and they are in stark contrast to the therapists that I know, because the best therapist I know, and I'm thinking, especially here of Kelly Wilson, they're so real with their clients. They're so human and empathetic and authentic, and they don't pitch themselves as being these psychologically Zen human beings with all the answers. They pitch themselves as someone who can listen and someone who's gone through some stuff themselves and someone who might have some ideas for what to do about it when you go through some stuff. And yet when I've read self-help books in the past, they're filled with the techniques and with the information, but that humanness, that authenticity as a human is just gone from, from a lot of them. And so from the very outset with this book, I wanted to write something that was real, that would allow the reader an insight into me as a human being. And it's for that reason that uh, it's filled with personal stories and with first person writing. Mm. I write the book from my perspective, not from a third person perspective. And so I'm, I'm really happy that that landed in that, in that way for you. And I think that that was the only way to write a book like this, because the thing about students, this is gonna sound crazy but this is the way that it is, is that they don't read many books, most of them. And so I have, I've got the task of writing a book about well-being. Like this isn't a book about skydiving or uh, you singing in front of 50,000 fans at Wembley Stadium. This isn't a book written by a celebrity that's all gung-ho. This is a book about psychological well-being. So you're just thinking, how am I gonna be able to write something for that age group for that population that that will 
encourage them to keep reading that will get them past the first few pages or the first chapter. And I think that the way that I've tried to achieve that is by being real, is by allowing them to see me as a human being and trust me as a, as a credible source and therefore think, you know what, this, this dude might have some, some interesting things to say that might be useful to me. And also by trying to make it entertaining and adding humor in there. And so it really is, a, I edited it a thousand times just to try and get this mix of authenticity and humanness with practical and concrete advice for how to uh, thrive with regards to their well-being with humor in there as well and so it's um it's lovely to hear you to hear you say that because i gave i gave everything this book and so and, and i've been reading it the last few days because i've now actually got this uh Yay. i've got an actual physical copy of it which is amazing and i and i, I said in a tweet yesterday i stand next to it i'm proud of it this isn't a tokenistic attempt for me at writing a book this for me is the book i was meant to write and in some ways it's the book i've always been writing because there are parts of this book that i wrote 10 years ago i've always been writing and i've always been trying to articulate my thoughts about the nature of life and where act fits in with that and where well-being fits in with that and i, I put it all together in this one this one book and i say i say right at the end to students that i've basically taught you my philosophy for living and the thing about it is it is a philosophy for living and not just a philosophy for university. So the skills that exist in this book, you like, you take the, uh, the chapter titles, the chapter titles map onto the six ways to well-being, as you all well know. These are the things that psychologically healthy people tend to do. Things like, well, chapter two is exercise and then challenge yourself and then connect with people, then give to people, then self-care and embrace the moment. So psychologically healthy people tend to do th those things. It gives that concrete advice that, yes, is going to be useful in university, but those things are going to carry people forward onto the, in, into their lives. I mean, the pitch of the book is that everybody in the world knows those six ways to well-being are probably good for them, but not everybody achieves them. And the reason for this is because of their thoughts and their feelings, and maybe they're not managing them in the optimal way. And so then you throw act in as the solution to that. So when you get difficult thoughts and feelings, when you're trying to exercise, when you're trying to challenge yourself, maybe these are some things that you could do with them. And so I really think it's a powerful combination of ACT and some mainstream well-being work that will be useful in university and will be useful beyond as well. A lot of the people that have read it so far aren't students and say how much they, they get from it. And I myself read it and get something from reading it. It changes what I do, what I do in the world. And so... That's a really long answer there to, uh, to your review, but you, you hit on the notes that I really would have liked you to have hit on. And so uh, I appreciate that, Ross. I think what is enormously generous of you in what you've done in creating this is your humanity and examples from your life and showing that life isn't always sunny and perfect and easy. That makes it, that makes the way you speak to the reader really authentic and it's like it's like having a chat with you in real life. Well, it's probably more coherent than having <laughs> a chat with me in life because it, it's so heavily edited across time. I'll backtrack a little bit. When you go through publishing with a mainstream publisher, the way to do that is to get a literary agent. And that took some time. And I got a literary agent called Jamie Marshall. And when you get a literary agent, they're like, right, we need to put together a synopsis in a first chapter. That first chapter had massive holes in it. And so it took Jamie and I, I'm going to say 20 edits to get that first chapter to a place where it was good. And then we had the synopsis and we sent it off to the publishing house and they ended up, uh, Little Brown ended up offering me a contract. The rest of the chapters were easy to write because of what I'd learned in putting together that first chapter. And now I'm, I'm really proud of that first chapter because it really, it lays the groundwork for what comes afterwards, which is before we talk about how to achieve better well-being. Let's talk about poor well-being and how that happens. And in that particular chapter, I talk about how it's pitched in modern day life that happiness is the normal state of affairs. But then when you look at all the people in the world that are suffering in some way, whether it's depression or anxiety or addiction or whatever it is, then and, and you look at that across a lifetime, you more or less cover everyone. So this thing that is pitched as being abnormal is actually a very normal human experience. But just because it's a normal human experience, that doesn't tell us a whole lot about what to do with these unwanted thoughts and feelings when they come along. 
Mm. And then I go on to talk about avoidance and how people will try their best not to have them because they're not nice. And because we've been taught, you know, if you feel a certain way, try and change how you feel. And then I talk about some of the pitfalls of avoidance in terms of it's the way that it can narrow your life. You know, you start avoiding uh, people and places because those people and places might bring up in you unwanted thoughts and feelings and your, your life goes like this. Or you might avoid in really unhelpful ways like drinking or drugs or 10 tubs of Ben and Jerry's. And so I just try to help the students and the reader to, to see that, to see that all happen and to leave the space for maybe something different other than avoidance mm. as a way to manage unwanted thoughts and feelings. And that, of course, is what we get to with the rest of the book. And so when you talk about that quote, that I'm fine tattooed on my forehead or on the foreheads of everyone, that quote is speaking to that conflict or that contrast in society whereby everybody is telling everyone they're fine and inside not many people are, are actually fine because it's really normal as human beings to suffer and you can imagine as i'm writing that first chapter i'm thinking how is this gonna land with students because the message you're sending someone is it's a negative message you're saying life's hard people die you're gonna lose your jobs you might have physical illnesses. You might find yourself isolated in a one bed flat in the, in the middle of a world changing pandemic. You know, these things, they happen, they make life hard. The result of that is gonna be unwanted thoughts and feelings. That's the way that it is, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And so that first chapter is, they might be thinking, I'm not sure I wanna read on, you know, this guy's a bit, a bit negative, but it was important that I was real. That I was, look, this is the way that it is. I'm not gonna patronize you. This is the way that it is. But you know what? The rest of this book is going to give you some ideas for how to improve your well-being, even whilst having unwanted thoughts and feelings. And so, yeah, I'm glad that you've picked up on that on that quote as well. Mm. And what I really, really believe is that we need to give people the opportunity to, to hear about these skills and understand them earlier in their lives before they reach the workplace because it's having such an impact on the workplace. In my work, the work I do with Paul Flaxman at City University of London, some of our research is showing that people who volunteer to come on and act in the workplace program, maybe four sessions, three sessions, we do some measures and between 40 and 50 percent of them are experiencing borderline clinical levels of psychological distress. 40 mm. to 50 percent. It's incredible, isn't it? If there's a chance that by sharing these skills beforehand to students and little spoiler here in some of your other work the connect program for schools is looking at sharing those skills at an even younger age and for the people supers out there both nick and duncan gillard will be on an episode in the not too distant future talking about that connect program but where was i getting to where was i getting to those numbers are scary that 40 to 50 percent of people going into the workplace are bordering on clinical at least subclinical levels of distress and that just speaks to what we were just saying about about how commonplace suffering is but of course if those people don't know what to do with suffering they're probably going to do things that exacerbate that suffering and so what they need is some knowledge about what to do with discomforts where do they need to run away for it can they still act in a way that's in line with their values, or can they still do things that are important to them even when they're not feeling too good? So mm -hmm. that by the time those feelings pass, they've still got some sort of life that's uh, ticking over. But the link to my book is actually a really interesting one because the point you're getting at is that it would be lovely to have preventative work in place prior to them going into the workplace so that by the time they get to the workplace, they're not suffering from subclinical levels of distress, for example. And that's essentially what Connect is. And that's what my book is. It's aimed at that. But, and this has been in, in my, on my mind quite a lot, which is this. If you're an 18 year old and up to the point of 18 years old, you've not really lived a life or been exposed to too much suffering. I'm not sure you're going to look at my book and think it's for you because at that age, maybe you don't have the wisdom to think, oh, all right, I'm not suffering right now, but one day it might come along. And when it comes along, I'll have this book to guide me. It would give me these skills in a preventative way. So I address this early on in the book. I say, look, if you have suffered, this book is going to help you. But if you've not suffered, if you consider yourself someone who's just lived a great life so far and not had so many unwanted thoughts and feelings, this book can still matter to you. And the reason for that is twofold. One, you can use the information in it to help your friends 
because you're guaranteed to meet people that are suffering when you go into university and the workplace. But two, as your life changes, as the context of your life changes, so might your likelihood of suffering. And so you look at the way that a context changes for an 18 year old, they go from an A-level college, for example, where they've got great pastoral support. They've got people helping them every step of the way. And they go to university where they're left to their own devices. Academics haven't got time to be chasing students if they're not submitting their work, haven't got time to be checking up on them. The context has changed. They're now living with new people. They're now having to look after their own finances. They're now having to walk into lecture halls where they know no one. Everything has changed. And as that changes, of course, unwanted thoughts and feelings might come up. And this book is gonna give you skills to manage unwanted thoughts and feelings and give you a, a guide or a blueprint for some things you might want to consider doing to improve your well-being, like your exercise or your challenging yourself or embracing the moment or connecting with people. These are important well-being behaviors that will help your life to keep ticking over when things change and when and when things get a little bit harder. I'm, I'm going to get that question a lot, I think. That idea that people don't know what's coming in the future and therefore they don't know that they need a preventative intervention. And that's essentially what my book is. It's a preventative intervention. Mm. So what I'm really relying on actually are probably parents and grandparents and aunties and uncles to think, well, my uh, granddaughter, Kelly, she's doing really well and stuff, but you know, she might not always do well because I know more about the nature of life. And when that comes along, I'd love to have this book for her to have read this book and gleaned some information from it that might function to protect her when suffering comes along. I've tried to create that argument in the opening chapter and I hope that I've done it and I think that it's written in an entertaining way that even a student with great well-being might read it mm. be entertained and get something from it it's, it's such an interesting question because I think young people are more in touch or there's more young people having more conversations about well-being emotions mm. how they feel mm. than they were in my day I'm mm. 53 years old and I went to uni I've been to uni three times I've been a student three times because I just bloody love it so much but that first time imagine imagine this 18 year old lanky skinny youth with big hair in 1986 going to Dundee University being dropped off by his mom and dad with a trunk of stuff a Grace Jones poster a House Martins poster and a sandwich toaster and completely unprepared for what was happening mm. We didn't really talk about feelings and emotions. Going to university was just something that was assumed that I would do. Mm. I didn't really give it much thought. I went through it. I, I really enjoyed it, don't get me wrong. But there were many issues I faced that I avoided and hid. I was in the closet when I arrived at university that time, and I was in the closet when I left. And things like that. I did learn to express myself. I thought I was a member of Erasure, the group. So I had my jeans rolled up with Doc Martin's shoes and a flat top. I got rid of the big <laughs> bush and I thought it was pretty cool. But there was, there was much suffering and self-work that I avoided. And mm -hmm. I think there'll still be young people going to university with things like that. And there'll be some who are more open and accustomed to talking about emotions mm -hmm. and feelings and things they're yeah. perhaps avoiding. Maybe. I mean, maybe th there's definitely been that change, hasn't there, with regards to conversations about mental health becoming more commonplace. I think that a lot of those conversations happen at surface level. They happen on social media. People will wear mental health based T-shirts. People will get involved with conversations about mental health at a, at a surface level. And I think that's it. I don't know if many detailed deep and nuanced conversations happen about the nature of mental health and about what it means for people and about potential ways forward. You just look at the conversations that happen about mental health. And I'm talking about from celebrities. I'm talking about from the royals. I'm talking about people that you see on TV. Mental health is still pitched as this very abnormal thing that it makes you abnormal if you suffer and just from that position the entire conversation about mental health has changed and my book offers something different it offers a different perspective and that perspective it disarms people when it comes to their suffering because if you buy into the idea 
that mental health problems are abnormal and then you have a mental health problem, you immediately equate yourself as having an abnormal experience. Or you say, I am abnormal. Now that is a panicking thought. All of a sudden you're thinking, oh my word, I'm abnormal. I need to do something about this. And so then you get into your, okay, what causes mental health problems? Maybe biological abnormalities. Okay, let's take some antidepressants. Or you get into a problem solving mode of mind with regards to your own abnormality. Now you think of the pitch of act, but you think of the, what's written in the first chapter of my book. I take that away altogether because now when you have a mental health problem or you have suffering of some sort, I'm saying to you, yeah, this is about right. This is about where you should be. You know, life can be hard. Let's think about next steps. Let's think about how you're gonna respond to this. What are the best ways to respond to this normal human experience, but an experience that's not particularly nice. Mm. But all of a sudden we haven't got someone equating themselves as being a problem to solve or being abnormal. So although there are conversations about mental health around the place that are much more common these days, I'm not sure many of those conversations are actually helpful in helping people relate to their own mental health in a more functional way. Mm. And so I think that's what my book offers. It offers a, a real and a deep and nuanced perspective on mental health and how to improve well-being moving forward. And the well-being guide that I offer isn't the absence of unwanted thoughts and feelings. You are going to feel down at times. You are going to feel anxious at times. You're a human being. But those things need not stop you from achieving things. They need not stop you from moving forwards and doing what's important to you. And that is where the main problem lies. The main problem isn't unwanted thoughts and feelings. The main problem is our maladaptive response to them. And so that's the message of the book. And that's a very different message mm. to what has come out there. But maybe the fact that mental health is a more commonplace conversation will mean that your average 18, 19, 20 year old who hasn't really contacted too much suffering at that point may pick up my book and think, oh, you know, I'll give this a read because mental health is quite interesting. Whether they would have the wisdom to think I'm going to use this because at some point in the future it might come in helpful. I'm not sure many people have that sort of wisdom. And so it'll be interesting. I'd love to get a demographic of the people that read it and see, you know, what sort of people are reading and getting something from this book. And I guess I'll probably never get that data. But if there are people listening who pass on the book, to uh, 18, 19, or to any any age student, really. And those students then read it. Yeah, I'd love to know what they think. Tell them to tweet me, tell them to email me. I, I want to know what students mm. think of this book. And we'll we'll put links to all your social channels and the, the website as well. Cool, that's great, because everybody keeps telling me, you want to sell books? You've got to build your platform. And uh, building a platform is not something I'm experienced in, Ross, and not something I particularly enjoy it either and so i i figure what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna apply to go on love island <laughs> get really get really like fit and stuff not tell anyone that i'm married and got a child play that game get a million followers on twitter and then i'll sell loads of books so maybe that's like an easier strategy for me yeah yeah i like that because with the best will in the world you're not paris hilton no i'm not unfortunately but i, I would hold my own because i'd be <laughs> the funny older slightly weird guy on love island maybe big brother maybe not love island maybe big brother maybe Towie. i'll just turn up to essex and ah. just find my way onto that program and then increase my my platform so that i can sell more books because like yeah doing it manually is hard so yeah if, if you've got people listening to this follow me on twitter it's gonna make my life easier going forward yeah i quite like to see you on big brother i don't know if big brother still exists i suspect it doesn't it might not yeah, it might not. If it does, if, if anyone from Big Brother's listening, yeah. I'll come on it. I can I can be the psychologist, but we won't tell anyone. It'll be a secret. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go in there, I'll pretend I do something else, but in secret, I'll be the psychologist and I'll bring you back analysis of the uh, of the people living in the house. Oh, mate, let's let's put a bid in, because I, I want to yeah. put a bid in to be the, the voiceover. Person. You could do that brilliantly. That would be amazing. Dear 58, Nick <laughs> is on the sofa. <laughs> Nick hasn't got off the sofa for four days. <laughs> he's, a, he's he's absolutely exasperated with conversations about mental health and suffering. He's decided <laughs> to bury his head in the pillow. <laughs>
Nick, as we've mentioned, you were our first guest on season two of the People Soup podcast way back in 2018 when we talked over Skype. Remember Skype in the olden days? I do. And you talked about this book, and this is where this book was born. And if I can, when I edit this, I'll go through some sort of music where it kind of, let me take you back, some sort of <laughs> sort of glockenspiel or something. Yeah, yeah. Now, you mentioned earlier uh, an, another project you, you're thinking about. Is, is that related to your blog, or what's that about? You know what life is like. You bounce around and different things hit you at certain times, and sometimes those things that hit you, they interact. Hmm. Um, and so, first of all, I, I, like you, have wanted to make ACT accessible for people, and I speak the ACT language to my students uh, and try and use it, try and sort of like give them skills to manage their thoughts and feelings. And so I want to make it accessible, and I want to contribute, and I want to sort of connect with people, etc., and so act is like this thing that's important to me. Mm. And at the same time as that, I'm developing my writing via blogs. And I, and I quite like the process of writing and, and, and really trying to write in a, in a clear and accessible way. And at the same time, I had a son called Max, who when you have children, you, you sort of like everything, everything changes after that. Yeah, I guess, and, I guess your, uh, value, your values change. Yeah, they have. Actually, I mean, I did a values clarification exercise shortly after Max, and something showed up that had never showed up before, which was keeping my family safe or something like yeah, that. Yeah, wow. And I was like, oh, right, that's never been there before. Before now, I could jump out of an aeroplane, no problem. But now I'm like, right, we need to be careful when we cross this road. Yeah. And so, yeah, things, things definitely change. Uh, but going back uh, slightly, we got those three things, like this act thing, this author thing, and this dad thing. Mm. And um, and then, you know, tragedies happen every day. And I know that a tragedy could happen to me, mm. if you like. And this was, uh, this sort of came to the surface, if you like, while watching The Lion King. And, you know, there's that, that moment in The Lion King where Mufasa dies. And I was like, sat there watching it with my son thinking, I could die. Christ, like, oh, yeah. No. I know, it's like one of those moments where I was like, don't cry, Nick, don't cry, don't <laughs> cry. Um <laughs> But as a result of sort of like all those things bouncing together, I yeah. thought, okay, right. If I die tomorrow, these are some things that I want my son to know. And so I'm sort of in the process right now. This, by the way, nobody might ever read this. At the moment, this is just for me and Max. But I'm in the process of writing what's essentially a self-helpy type mm. book to my son with nine rules for living. And um, I'll give it to him on his 18th birthday. And so, like, maybe something will come of that with regards to publishing it or something. Maybe it won't. But, like, I'm enjoying the, the process of writing about ACT in that format and for and for my son. And it's relatively therapeutic because it's, like, semi-autobiographical. Yeah. So, and it's chronological as well. So it sort of, like, weaves different events that have happened in my life over the last 33 years and ties those to certain psychological principles. And so I'm, in, I'm enjoying doing that at the moment. Uh, you know, just as a, another sort of... You know, on so many occasions, my mind to say, "Why are you doing this for? You know, he's not going to like this, or people won't like this, or this is going to be a lot of work. Have you really got time to do this right now?" Mm. Uh, but I sort of act and uh, diffusion, bit of willingness as well, sort of get me, get me to the place where I actually start typing on my computer. Wow! Uh, and so we'll see, we'll see what comes of that. Hey Supers, that's it, part one in the bag. And just for the avoidance of any doubt, that last little segment was from my interview with Nick in 2018, hence the groovy wind chime sound effects. That little clip gave a glimpse of the origin story of the book and the important role that The Lion King played in its inception. Tune in next time where we'll talk more about the book with Nick. If you like this episode or the podcast, could I invite you to share it with one other person? I'm really keen to spread the behavioural science and skills with more people. Of course, a subscription, follow, rating or review are also very, very much appreciated. The show notes are at rossmackintosh.co.uk and this includes links to a few different platforms. I love to hear from you and you can get in touch at peoplesoup.pod at gmail.com On Twitter, we're at peoplesouppod On Instagram, at people.soup and on Facebook, we are at peoplesouppod Thanks to Andy Glenn for his spoon magic, Alex Engelberg for his vocals, and DJI Projects for the wind chime effects. Most of all, dear listener, thanks to you. 
Look after yourselves, peace supers, and bye for now. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Because with the best will in the world, you're not Paris Hilton. No, I'm not, unfortunately. But I, I would hold my own. Because I'd be <laughs> the funny, older, slightly weird guy on Love Island. Maybe Big Brother. Maybe not Love Island, maybe Big Brother.